After I got saved, I was wrapped in this light, in this security in, in who God was. But as time went by, I got involved with the word faith church. There was a glamour attached to the word faith movement. There was a sense of a Hollywood style ministry. And you had to have some kind of manifestation of God's presence through you in order to prove that God could use you. My name is Zintle Pondo. I've never really followed the Word of Faith teachings. They just never seemed biblical to me. But to be honest, I never really gave this too much thought. I saw Salvador's first documentary, Allegiance, Walking with the Dead, and I was struck by the testimony of people being saved out of ancestral worship and necromancy. Then to find out that Jean got caught up in the Word of Faith movement kind of surprised me. Why would someone like her do that? So Salvador invited me to take a journey of discovery concerning the Word of Faith movement. I was intrigued, but I was also hesitant. The big thing for me was not wanting to offend anyone. In the Word of Faith movement, there's emphasis on the action, emphasis on the miracle. You're taught to claim your BMW, claim your Mercedes, claim your mansion, and so on. By giving, then People can be rich and people can have good health. The principles, they work whether you're a believer or not. The principles, like, yeah. If you, yeah. Through, because of gravity, the principle of gravity is going to come down. So if you sow a seed, you're going to like harvest a crop. It always works whether you're a believer or not. When Adam was so old, he begat a son in his own image. Right? If you have dolphins and dolphins have babies, they're dolphins. If you have cats and they have babies, they're cats. And if God is going to have children, it was before the elections, if around the time that Nelson Mandela was freed, and there was a lot of. Um, Fear of the future, actually, of what was going to come down the pipe. And we were involved in some of the unrest in the area here, close to us, and we witnessed the things that were going on on TV, and I did feel fearful about the future. And when someone that I worked with invited me to church, I thought, well, maybe that's not a bad idea. And she invited me to, to come along with her to a Word of Faith church. That whole idea of man being in charge and God being trapped and God needing us to fulfill his will. If you just yes, it this. seems to be more that God is your servant. Um, it always, the analogy of Aladdin with the lamp struck me when I had left Ramah and Aladdin rubs the lamp and the genie comes out and says, what do you want to a master? They treated um, disasters that happen to people is like you've attracted something to you it's it's superstitious you know yes. you must have done something that the gods are angry with you is. that is how they seem to use god that you can say these things and you give money to god and then he has to answer you and when you're doing well when you've got a lot of stuff then really god is very happy with you he's very pleased with you and that's why he's blessing you Superstition is something that plagues so many people in South Africa. Appeasing to ancestors for protection, paying Sangomas for Muti. Philip Ruzawa was a member of a major Word of Faith movement church. He also recognized that a form of superstition was in his church. My name is Philip. Uh, I am from Zimbabwe. When I joined Christ Embassy, there were uh, really advertising this thing about healing school so much. It's very much like so bad they don't accept offering, they don't accept any donations. It's free. So they say. 
but now as you become a member, the jaws start to close <laughs> slowly. <laughs> God becomes uh, that mafia that if you don't do this, <laughs> so you have to pay your protection fee, you have to pay your tithe, you need to pay him when you get paid and so that you can keep on blessing you. Well, that sounds very much like what African traditional religion almost teaches. Something struck me about the superstitious nature of the Word of Faith teachings. Could what we see in the Word of Faith circles be a Christianized version of African traditional religion? Having watched the documentary Allegiance, Walking with the Dead, I saw a story of how Mujuru was saved from ancestral traditions. I went to his home in Pretoria to interview him. He was to provide very insightful similarities between the Word of Faith teachings and ancestral teachings. I spent quite uh, some years in the Word of Faith movement, 15 years plus. Started to conjure up memories about where I was coming from, from ancestral worship. In ancestral worship, you have your great grandfathers, grandmothers, coming to manifest through a medium who is one of the, you in the family. My father got sick. And we could not find the reason why he was sick. Doctors could not find anything. Okay. Until, as a family, we start to suspect that this could be an ancestor who wants to come. So now when I came into the Word of Faith movement, you start to hear people with the call of God, so they say. Okay. When uh, they, God called them, they had an accident because they were resisting the call of God, or they got sick. And now people have stickers. <laughs> I love the stickers. <laughs> people have stickers. People have water. They have things they get mm -hmm. from the prophets. Yep. And the Word of Faith movement, the emphasis is getting healing, mm -hmm. getting protection, yes. getting jobs, mm -hmm. a miracle money. In ancestral worship, it's there as well. We, you have miracle money in ancestral worship. The, that type of gospel has been easy to penetrate Africa because from the, I think from the background of sacrificing. So if you sacrifice your money, you get something. It's, 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 it's the mentality. It's, I think it was easier for them just to, to capture the the African people using the, the, that concept. But uh, a trigger came in me one, one day is uh, we were collecting some offerings. Yes. And uh, they said we must collect an offering for grace. I, I, I gave my money for grace. But as I left, the Holy Spirit upwells in me scriptures, Ephesians. We are saved by grace, freely given, so that no one should boast. Then yes. I'm thinking, so what was that money they were collecting about? Hmm. It was grace money going to the founder of the church. If the Word of Faith movement allows African people because of similarities between itself and African traditional religion, then why is it so widespread with people who are not from a black African background? Are these similarities simply coincidental? This must be clarified. Anton Fervey in Port Elizabeth noted similarities between the Word of Faith theology and certain New Age mind science practices. I went to Port Elizabeth to ask him about his thoughts and experiences coming out of the Word of Faith movement. So my, my background uh, is a Pentecostal 
Protestant background. And at the age of 17, I became born again. Um, and as a young man, I was looking for a church. So this was all new to me, but because it was always related back to scripture, I thought that they were following the word of God. After about five years, um, I really felt spiritually drained. The messages always revolved around giving or receiving some kind of blessing. Um, and then not long afterwards, a friend of mine gave me a DVD to watch. Um, it was called The Secret and I didn't know anything about it. And I put it on and I watched it. And I immediately realized it is New Age teachings. Um, but what really struck me and, and flabbergasted me is that a lot of the terms that I heard them use in the secret, a lot of the techniques, were very similar to what I had heard in the Word of Faith movement. So, with regards, you mentioned the secret. What are some of the parallels? If you could just give us a few examples. So, in, in the secret, what they do is they, they concentrate on something which is called the law of attraction. And they believe by using positive thought and positive words and positive actions, they can get the universe to respond in a positive way and give them all their dreams and desires. The word of faith is very much the same. Um, the secret will speak about the universe in the place of God. Um, they will speak about the law of attraction, where the word of faith movement will speak about the law of faith. But all of it is really based on having positive thoughts, using positive words in order to create this blessed reality. Yes, they are very into laws. And one of the things that they say is that even God has to obey these laws. Never mind that God made the universe and everything is subject to what His will is. But God is subject to all these laws. By 2009, my business had gone bankrupt and I'd lost everything. And when I say everything, I lost everything. And it took years for me to kind of come out of that. And just as I started coming out of it, I got a call from my mother. And she said to me, my sister passed away. And what made it really bad is that my sister was murdered. And seven months after my sister passed away, I was in a major car accident. Nine out of 10 times, a person would have died in a car accident, but I survived. So now you might ask, how can that bring glory to God? And I'll tell you how. God has restored everything that I lost with my business, my home, everything. He's restored it back to me, double to what I had. Scripture says that we don't mourn like the world. I know I will get my sister back. God spared my life in that car accident. But the greatest blessing that I received from that is that I had massive opportunities to stand up in church and tell people, look at what the Lord has done. Look at the marvelous works of God. I didn't speak anything into existence. I just kept my faith in Jesus Christ. You know, it's, a, it's amazing the preoccupation with money in this movement, as opposed to souls. We all want to hear that, you know, we can live a life where everything only goes well and we achieving our dreams and whatever we want from God, we can just ask. The reality is from scripture, it is different. Jesus said, count the cost. There is a cost to our faith and walking in faith with Jesus Christ. It is not that God is not interested in our daily lives. He even knows when a little bird falls on the ground. But God is more interested in our walk with Him, our daily walk with Him, in trusting Him no matter what the circumstances might be. I sort of assume that only a particular type of person would be attracted to this sort of doctrine. 
I've since learned that it's people from all walks of life. It's basically people that are struggling in one form or the other. You know, someone could have all the money in the world, but then they may still need to be healed. Someone could be poor and just desperate, and they see this as a way of just getting out of that situation. So you then come to the realization that um, these sort of doctrines attract people from all walks of life, all races, all genders. But at least to me, well, at least as I see it, the, the end effect is always the same. Just shattered dreams and hopes, and the danger of destroying genuine faith in Christ. I was brought up in a very poor family. We lived in Durban, and uh, somebody came door to door on evangelism and invited my family to church, and I got born again there. I then found myself influenced by Rama and then studied three years through Kenneth Hagin ministry. Straight after that, I became a prosperity preacher. So in the Rama doctrine, I never knew about the sovereignty of God, never heard it. I was coming to the end of my studies and I had a anjana while I was exercising okay. on early morning run. So as a prosperity person, I was never supposed to get sick. What happened was I got home after the run. My wife being a nursing sister, she said to me, what's wrong, why are you so pale? I said, I just had a little pain in my chest, but I'm not gonna confess it because then I'd be receiving sickness and I'm fine. My wife phoned a good friend of ours who also studied at Roma, but he was a medical doctor. Now, how's that for a paradox? <laughs> and I walked in and uh, they did an ECG and my doctor literally burst into tears. He said, you're going nowhere, you're going ICU. That Saturday night, that was on a Thursday when I was admitted, that Saturday night, I had a full-blown heart attack. And I cried out to God and I said, God, why? Why, after serving you, why all this pain and agony? I don't believe in, I believe you are our healer. And also believed in a dualism, that all sickness comes from sin and the devil. And that I personally opened my life to the devil somewhere along my Christian walk. When I came out of theater, Went into, us, uh, went into ICU, my life changed dramatically. Uh, within six months, I resigned from the organization because I was taught basically undergrad, which teaches you ethics and values. And I realized that my ethics and my values didn't line up with, with the Word of God and that I had to resign, and so I resigned based on that principle. It is interesting to note the preoccupation with health and wealth, particularly in Steve Watt's case. This is before his experiences challenged his theology. This was also something that struck me previously with what Anton shared. People seem to be attracted to this gospel because it focuses on enjoying your best life in the here and the now and not looking forward to eternity. In fact, eternity and ruling and reigning with Christ becomes secondary or just it's never even mentioned. Seeing how the Lord was gracious to Anton was an encouragement to me. You know, Anton didn't confess prosperity or follow some spiritual laws, he just kept his faith, kept on working hard, kept on trusting God. And just that encouragement that when we continue to do that, God can really come into our lives and bless us. Pelelani Ngobo is a pastor with the Apostolic Faith Mission. He ministers to some of the poorest communities in around Peter Marisburg. I thought I'd pay him a visit to get a view on what he calls economic salvation. Someone said you, you coined the term economic <laughs> salvation. If you could just explain how you, what that actually means to you. 
uh, it actually means the now salvation is now centered on economic thing. People are no longer coming to Christ purely for, I would say, for eternity, for eternal life, for, for them to be right with God, to have a good relationship. But instead, now they come for economic. Okay, in the South African context, hmm. there's a lot of poverty. Yes. People are struggling. Yes. Then somebody comes to you and says, but why do you have a problem with me if I'm helping these people that are poor? To me, by helping, you're not reaping from them. So I would, I would be differ to say a person who's reaping, who's getting from the, those who haven't got, is now saying he's helping them. Rather, if you're helping them, you empower them. Okay. And this is something that you're involved in? Yes. Empowering people? Yes. So we've got gardens where we plant vegetables as the church and sell it to community. Others, we give it to community. Secondly, we teach how to bake so that they can sell. That's uh, empowering. And uh, thirdly, we we also part of the prison ministry. So by that, we we then got the skills uh, schools at inside prison where we train them. We've got other people who are training them to to be carpenters. So you're not opposed? You're not opposed to helping people? I'm, I'm not opposing that, but I'm opposing ripping from people in the name of salvation. To me, I, I consider it as stealing because they promise that uh, if, if somebody is sick, they would say he must give. Although he's sick, for a person to get to receive his miracle, he needs to give something. They'll say, give to God. Now, the person is desperately looking for healing. Then he will give from the list he has. And then tomorrow, still nothing happens. In our days, people are giving through envelopes, but there are no real miracles. The one who's sick will still go back sick. Uh, people would come to church and being entertained by the nice music, but the, the presence of the Lord is not there. They haven't been touched by the presence of the Lord. They've been entertained. I've got a crash. I look after kids and my husband um, is doing blogs. I also sell clothes like gowns, bedding and everything. So that's where I get my energy from. There was a revival and then they were just saying you must take out your most uh, favorite thing, the thing that you like a lot. Because okay. it's the thing that's um, blocking your blessings. And I remember I had that jacket. It was the first jacket that I bought. It was so expensive, close wow. to 700 rand. And then I thought, I took it out. I gave it to them. But I'm still the old still cine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. I take it you were not the only person. Mm, yeah. Other we, people did that. Even cell phones. Even cell phones and the money, I remember there were different envelopes from 50 rand to a thousand rand. So one lady only took the envelope for a thousand rand and I could only afford 50 rand. So I took that envelope, but then they would say, your blessings will go the way you've, you've paid. Like if it's a thousand rand, I mustn't expect to get a lot as she will get. So yeah. Okay. Like, so you're not against giving? Mm, no, I'm not against okay. it. And I wish, like every day, I wish I, I also like to do it. Yes. But then sometimes if they will tell you that if at the end of the month you get three thousand rand, you must take out three hundred rand. 
before you do anything else but i would say i've got a lot of kids i need to first pay for their school fees for their transport for food electricity and stuff and then i'll see how much i've got left then i can pay but then if i need to take out that 300 strand it's too much for me okay but in your experience you found that a lot of people that are doing this their condition remains the same their life yeah and then the pasta always goes higher like we, we're still saying in rdp houses no car no nothing and then the pastor got about two vehicles flies to job do this and then usually they will post um having their breakfast out in the restaurants while i still bake fed cooks for my kids to eat but then i have to pay for him to be a rich how would you say this teaching this tithing confessing and things into reality how would you say those teachings have affected people in shagas it does affect them a lot. Most people doesn't even go to church because if you tell them about going to church, they will tell you, firstly, about my church, they will tell you that people wear high heels, they, they wear nice clothes, so I don't have it. So I'll only go to church after I have that. And then they'll tell you they always want money. I don't even have money for my food. So, no. So it's affected them a lot. So in 1981, I emigrated to South Africa to advance my career and just break out of the paradigm. I saw my life going in at the time. And I went into very large computer centers. My family basically conspired to trick me into a church. So they told my son to come and say, look, Dad, you're not making me go to church. I don't really want to go, but if, if you come and give me some support, I'll be happy to carry on. And so that got me into a church, which happened to be Rhema Church in, in Randburg. If you could give us your honest sentiments about the word of faith currently, you know, no holds barred, how you actually feel about these sort of churches today. At the shepherd's level, the danger of word of faith is to encourage the worst kind of uh, attention-seeking, money-seeking, self-glorifying uh, attitude. And also, Word of Faith encourages you are anointed, so it encourages a dictatorial spiritual attitude, which certainly in Rhema was there. The pastor called in one of the services, he said, uh, if you got a feeling that you want to do something for the Lord, stay behind. You stayed behind. Obviously, you want to do something for the Lord. Then um, he said uh, he wants to, it was a Sunday. He said he wants to change the carpet for the whole church. He said, well, fine. Then uh, people started to pledge two months in advance. He went away for a few minutes. He came back. He said, we are putting the carpet on Tuesday. <laughs> so before you go out, I want the money. No. <laughs> wow. If you don't want, walk out. So you'll be like, I'm letting the Lord down. But I was brave enough, I walked out. <laughs> so people have big confidence in, in their leaders. They think what they are saying is correct. It's, it's no longer about Christ, it's about self. Paul the Apostle was a servant leader. And most of the apostles that we know of were servant leaders. Whereas in the modern faith movement, we have charismatic leaders. They are the ones that hear the voice of God. They're the ones that determine and interpret scripture. They're the ones that will tell people to do things even if it's ethically incorrect. So in a charismatic leader, he's always got to be right. He cannot be questioned. 
So it is a hierarchical system that leads to toxic behavior. To correct an organization, you sometimes have to employ a charismatic leader. But once he's got up and running, you need to move him because he destroys everything that he has built up because his ego is central. Celebrities has destroyed the Word of Faith movement. So maybe, maybe the problems we have in South Africa is also a problem in our church. Because the chieftain, as the leader of his tribe, is exactly the model that we have in the Word of Faith movement. And you never, ever speak against the man of God. They would argue, some at least, that, uh, well, it's only the love of money, and I don't love money. But if a pastor has a helicopter flight from the coast, living in a beachfront major property, arrives at the airport, gets picked up in a limousine, has bodyguards, drives him to a church in which he's ensconced through a private entrance that you wouldn't walk in the front because he's so important and he needs protection. And then that person stands up and encourages people with no money to give. I do not see personally anything moral or godly. And in fact, it's, to me, that would be demonic. The people I've interviewed so far paint a very bleak picture of the Word of Faith teachings. Though a few of them have even met each other, their testimonies seem to be consistent. They highlight some major issues. Do they really represent the Word of Faith teachings? I have no reason to doubt the authenticity of their claims, but it all seemed just unreal to me. So I struggle to understand how people can believe some of these things. So the three young men from Freyhead, Quentin, Lizzo and Siabonga were graciously willing to be interviewed and defend their understanding of the Word of Faith teachings. And their answers, I must say, left me a bit uh, perplexed. The main thing is that, what did Jesus come here for? Did Jesus come here to have us, you know, take us to heaven or did he want us to come and live here? If we, he came so that we can live here, which means there's a way that Jesus wants us, you know, to live our lives. So you cannot just, you know, come and say, you'll be saved and then le le leave us poor. Okay. Is this something that you also hold to, this idea of? Um, prosperity will not come by our own ability. But uh, with that being said, I fully agree that God desires us all to be prosperous as Christians. Because when he was speaking in the in, in Deuteronomy, he was he said that I am now bringing you into a, into a land where you shall not lack. So he was not speaking to an individual, but was speaking to Israel as a whole, which is me saying that I believe God desires for every Christian and every believer to be prosperous. If prosperity, then, as you've defined, we've defined it for us. Depends on all these elements, people being obedient, a whole lot of things. Then if people are not obedient, then what? <laughs> then, 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 then where does prosperity come? Uh, you find that there's a person, who is a, there's a business person uh, who tithes, yeah. but is not a person who comes to church. And yeah. you find that maybe the lifestyle is not good. 
but for the fact that he tithes. He respected the principle of God. And uh, by tithing and giving 10%, God blessed him. Okay, I, I, I like the direction you're going. Mm. So if this guy is beating up his wife, mm. he's sleeping around with minors, mm. God still has to bless him because of this principle. He still does it to an unbeliever. Okay. An unbeliever. Because we, we call ourselves believers because we believe in Jesus Christ and accepted him as Lord and mm -hmm. Savior. That is what a believer is. You find that they have not received Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Yeah. But they do do what the Bible speaks about, which is tithing. Yeah. So he, if the person beats up his woman and everything, but you find that he is still obedient when it comes to the, to, to the tithing part, uh, financially, he will still be blessed. Mm. But then, doesn't that then work against another principle? Another which principle. I've heard a lot of people mention, the sovereignty of God. Okay. So God can't override <laughs> this principle? No. <laughs> so then, the principle of faith as you've just mm. described it, then how would it apply in countries where people are poor, are being persecuted and... Um, we, can, we can make blame God that God, why God didn't you know, protect them or whatever. But let that alone is faith in God. And wherever, when their souls go to heaven, there's a great reward for such. You understand? Not because they're dead, they're dead poor. You know, there's a greater life for them because of the faith that they've confessed before they, they went to heaven. Mm. What we're saying is that now that I'm living here on earth, I wake up in the morning, should, 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 should I say it? Because I'm a Christian, I should be poor, I should not have food, I should not have clothing, I should not have this, I should not have this, I should not have a car, I should not have a big house. So the Bible have provided for us to have that kind of life, mm. you understand? So Christian must have a big car, Christian must have a big house. It is provided, mm. must, it is provided for us. Mm. Mm. So, so, it's, so if a, I'm it's seeing, a must, because when you say something must, you, you, you're saying this is something that must happen on all occasions. Yeah. You must have a big car. Yeah, the, God, God have a perfect will for us, a mm. good will for us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on this? Especially on the big car and the big house. Big and the big house. Must. <laughs> Oh, I wouldn't say we must, but if you can afford it, then it's good. Especially if you still gonna maybe provide, like God says, be kind, provide a home for those who doesn't have home, open your house for strangers. If you're gonna do for the purpose of the kingdom, then it's good. So you're still fulfilling God's purpose for that. Uh. So if the, the big car is gonna come and then you're gonna be take, helping people, maybe taking them to church or helping them to fulfill yeah. what they needed to do, then it's good. As long as the car and the house gonna save the purpose of the kingdom, then it's a win-win situation. I understand. So we're in a situation for who? <laughs> God. God and you, obviously. I mean, but God and you. I mean, other than, un unlike if it's going to be like you, the car serving only you, then it's like, it doesn't have to, it doesn't help like, contribute to what the kingdom thinks. Mm. I, I think what I want to get to is, God, is God then obligated to me if I'm a good believer, I pay my tithes, mm. I, must God heal me every time I'm sick? Must I, is it a must? I must have a big car. I must get the best jobs. I must, things must go well. <laughs> <laughs> if, if there was one okay. answer, if there was one answer, I'll tell you. you one answer. I'll tell you. If you promise it, it's obligated. One, one, one pastor yeah. of mine said to me one day, um, he said to me, and I, and I was like, wow. He said to me, you know what? It is a crime in heaven. It is a serious crime in heaven if really you are a tither and God doesn't do what he promised he would do to a tither. Mm. The three young men I've just interviewed seem to have a popular understanding of what a word of faith teachings are about, but they are not theologians. Philip Bays, on the other hand, is a word of faith pastor. He also lectures at Rema Bible College. I went there to ask him, in his defense, about some of the word of faith teachings. If you think about 2 Corinthians 8, right, when it talks about he became poor, Jesus became poor for our sake, so that we might become rich. And it's not talking about spiritual riches. The context 
is an offering being taken up for people that are starving. The believers in Jerusalem are going through a, a famine, a difficult financial time. And so Paul, when he spoke, was with the Corinthians, arranged that they would take up an offering. And he's sending Titus to pick up the offering on his way to Jerusalem. So the whole context is financial. How sure can the Christian be that these are, abs are these absolute promises? I believe that God wants to heal people's physical bodies because he loves them. He doesn't want to see them in suffering and in anguish. But dying from a sickness is not the worst thing that can happen to a human being. Dying without knowing Jesus is the worst thing that can happen to a human being. But I, I believe that it's easier, at least for me, I have a hard time praying when I have a headache. And that's small. I think it's hard to be fruitful if you are physically completely distracted by the suffering that you're going through physically. I think it's hard. It's not impossible. Okay, there are people with physical disabilities that still honor God with their lives. So it's not impossible, but I think it's hard. Well, one of the tenets of the Word of Faith movement is we will look at three. Mm -hmm. The idea that since we are made in the image of God, we ourselves are gods, therefore our words have powers. Let's take, let's take the we are gods kind of concept. Jesus actually quotes from the Old Testament in the Gospel of John. Jesus is challenged because he calls himself the Son of God. So Jesus takes that statement from the Old Testament. So, I think it's dangerous to say that this is completely unbiblical. Because we have it in the Old Testament, and we have Jesus himself quoting it in the New. Does that place me on the same level as the Creator? No. I will always be the offspring. In no way does that mean that we somehow dictate to God what should happen. So, yes, does our words have power? Very obviously from scripture, they do. It almost becomes a separate entity that you wield mm -hmm. as God meant to then. So, so you use your faith So you on use purpose. You use your faith on purpose phrase. to almost phrase. then manipulate. So then it creates that problem of faith in faith. Because I, then I, if, you, if you say it's a substance, mm -hmm. then it's separate from, you know, and, and this is what some I, of these guys teach. Okay. And, I, I, would and, ju I would just say, um, actually, if you, li if you listen to, I know the most controversial at the moment is probably Kenneth Copeland. But if you really listen to what he's saying, he repeatedly goes back to the principle of it has to be ba based on what the Word of God says. Whatever else you can say about the man, you have to acknowledge that the man takes it back every time to a scripture. So, so I, I think if people teach it as if you can just believe without having any basis in scripture for it, which I know some people do, all right, I would say that is a deviation from what Kenneth Copeland, for instance, would teach. Right. I've never heard him say, you can just believe for something regardless of whether or not there is a promise in Scripture. The way that he teaches it might be a little more mechanical than what I would teach it. I grant that, all right? But he would always say, you find your promise. One of the most disturbing elements in what I've seen so far is how pastors who are in error get protected. The idea that, oh, we should not touch the Lord's anointed, even when there's clear error in what he teaches. That, I think, is probably one of the most disturbing trends. Men get elevated to your godlike status. Maybe it's the word of faith teachings that we are gods, after all. That this seems to give rise to a toxic leadership, to the elevation of people, and denominations above God and His Word. Salvador, who 
directs this documentary saw this as a seminal doctrine, along with several other doctrines that have given rise to a lot of error in the movement. I thought it would be great if I interviewed him, as I had a number of questions coming out of my interview with Phil. Jesus quoted from the Psalms when he said to the um, Pharisees that the scripture says you are gods. Your scriptures say you are gods. And in the context of that, yes, Jesus was being accused of being a heretic because he claimed oneness with his father. However, if you look at the scripture there, you are gods is said to the leaders of Israel. The concept of godhood there is not that as God is, so are we. So a God wields um, power in his words, so we therefore have power in our words. The concept of godhood there is not divine beings. The concept is as under rulers wielding God's authority over people. A big aspect of the word of faith doctrine centers around money and giving and, and, and tithing. If you could just explain what biblical tithing was in the Old Testament mm. and the expectation for the believer, look, of the believer in the New Testament as far as giving and contributing to the church is concerned. The command to tithe was only given to the nation of Israel and it was never of money. That's not because money didn't exist. Money did exist in some form. They had silver. In fact, they gave of their silver and gold for the construction of the tabernacle. And during the time Jesus lived, there was a two drachma temple tax that they gave that was additional to the tithe. The tithe was of your increase. It was of your crops. It was of your livestock. The tithe system was a feeding system. It was to care for the Levites, the widows, the orphans, and the poor of the land. And so we, yes, Jesus came, it says, he became poor that we may be rich. And the context there is caring for the poor, is giving financially to the alleviation of their need. But the, the context of that statement is comparing Jesus with ourselves and saying, he became poor that we may be rich. And so how did Jesus become poor? Not that he left money behind in heaven. There is no money in heaven. There's no earthly gold in heaven. He left his riches in heaven and took on the poverty of being a servant, of being of low, of low estate on earth. And we share in Jesus' riches. So the Bible says that if we're in Christ, we're the richest of all people because we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's the context of Jesus' riches and Jesus' poverty. So what he's saying is share with these poor Christians your wealth because you are so rich in Christ with riches that will never wear out. Mm. If faith is a law and if it being a law, it never fails to work. And if there's this absolute promise of wealth, and happiness and everything in this life, and you don't have it, you don't have that healing, then whose fault is it? It's not God's will, because God is not willing that in your life. Mm. God's purpose is always for your prosperity and health. So it's not God's doing, so therefore whose fault is it? It's your fault. It has to be your fault. The natural outcome of that has to be, you've got some sin in your life, there's something, you're not using the right formula, so one guy on TV say, some of you are given to the church, you've given, you've given, but you've not received it. And you wonder why. He says, it's like a candy machine. If the chocolate bar costs a dollar and you put in 50 cents, you're not getting that chocolate bar. Wow. So in other words, you've got to give the right amount in order to get. Why? Because it's a law. It never fails to work. And as soon as we say that, no, God has purposes that we don't understand. And God may decide, I've got a purpose for you in your sickness. And it's a glorious purpose. The sickness is not glorious, but my purpose through that is glorious. So therefore, um, I want to keep you in that place for my purposes to be made. That's not in the word of faith scenario. Yeah. The word of faith says that's never God's will. Doesn't the gospel also emphasize material prosperity and not just salvation? 
Genesis 13 verse 2 says, Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and gold. Do we not also inherit the blessing of Abraham? Keegan Noble is a lecturer at Union Bible Institute. I visited him and asked him about this very question. The idea of the blessing of Abraham is a combination of verses from the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 to 14 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And in, in Genesis chapter 13 verse 2 it says, Now Abraham, or Abram, was very rich in cattle, silver and gold, or livestock, silver and gold. And so they therefore conclude that the blessing of Abraham that Paul is talking about is wealth. God promised Abraham, I'll bless you. Genesis 13, he's very rich. Galatians 3, the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. Therefore, God is promising wealth to those who believe in Jesus. Well, both in the Theo von Moran's book, The Blood Covenant, and in E.W. Kenyon's book, The Blood Covenant, it's based on an African tradition two people from a tribe might um, make a blood covenant and mix their blood together. And therefore, everything that belongs to the one party is accessible to the other party. So the concept is when God made a covenant with Abraham, everything that God owns is accessible to Abraham when Abraham needs it. Not everything that God promised Abraham is claimed by these people who say everything is available to us, such as the land. I've never seen someone like Copeland or Hagen or Kenyon or anybody say, I've got a stake in the land of Israel. But that's what God promised Abraham, isn't it? Now, if we look at Galatians chapter 3, you'll notice there that Paul is talking about being justified by the law versus being justified by faith. And it's in that context that he brings Abraham in. And you'll, you'll notice all the way, uh, let's pick up maybe verse 6, where um, he quotes from Genesis 15, verse 6, where it says, And Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So you notice, uh, firstly, that Paul is picking up on the fact that Abraham was justified by faith, not by works of the law. But notice verse 7, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So what is that blessing he's talking about? Justification by faith. You know, it's got nothing to do with Abraham's wealth here. Word of faith has affected so many people and not for the better. I find that even with the nuanced position of field based, the seminal doctrine of word of faith theology are still wanting and can still lead to bad fruit. But how can we engage? Rudolf Bosov, who's a lecturer at Rema Bible College, but is actually against the Word of Faith theology, counters it. Why would he then teach at such a college? He feels that it is easy to criticize any theology, but are we prepared to enter its context? So what does he think is wrong with the Word of Faith teaching? And how should we counter it? As somebody who teaches theology, what are some of the problems with the Word of Faith theology? It is so highly pragmatic, and we live in a very highly pragmatic society, mm -hmm. that it enables the individual uh, not just to actualize his own faith, but to really, uh, by the authority of God, to write their own ticket with God, as the, Kenneth e. Hagin says, um, and in actual fact to get to a place where you can actualize what you necessitate to be your portion or what is necessary for yourself. Because what we do is we are saying, but I don't need you, Jesus. I can just declare it by faith. I can believe that what I said is true. I can confess it because God said it and that settles it. And therefore I will get it. Um, again, the allure of such a faith in actual fact puts the individual in a place where he is deified. And, uh, I don't, need to, I don't need to say that, in actual fact, one of the uh, constitutes of the Word of Faith movement is that you become a little God. The unfortunate downplay to that is, is that we are not God. 
uh, we do not have power in ourselves. In actual fact, uh, I would say that proponents that teach that what we say is what we get um, is directly reduced from the metaphysical cults. The metaphysical cults believe that your words, in actual fact, have substance or power. And the allure to believe in your own faith uh, in the word of faith circles is that if you profess it in the right way, if you say it in the right way, you will actually, in actual fact, get exactly what you have said. And therefore, you're, the object of your faith is not God, but your words. What then do you say to someone who says, I'm just simply repeating what is written in the word? What's wrong with that? People are not really word of God people. And what I do whenever I'm in a conversation with anybody that have this, this variant belief, I show them that they are not truly a, a word of God person. They are a selective word of God person because they've got all these collective scriptures that they've highlighted in their Bibles that they confess often, uh, but they never look at the context. Here's a good exercise. Whenever you encounter somebody uh, that hyphenates a passage or isolates a passage, Read it with them. Show them the context and show them what that scripture in actual fact says. We need to show them that when James chapter 3 speaks about the power of the tongue, the power of the tongue is not necessarily speaking of the actualization of one's faith. It is speaking of the responsibility of gossip. It's speaking about understanding that wherever you speak provocatively, you are held accountable for your words. But it does not mean that your words has the effects to produce your realities. That's Oprah's secret. As you're speaking, a thought that comes to mind is then, what does God become in that equation? Absolutely. Because I'm, I'm, I'm God, and then, then there's an, I can see the conflict. Yes, it's interesting because when you actually reflect on the doctrine, um, some of the theolo some of the speakers in this uh, in this movement, Kenneth Yagen, Kenneth Copeland, and quite a other few, um, in actual fact, have described God literally in in, in very anthropocentric terms they would say God is six foot five and he's got this because he have the, the scripture says he measured the heavens with by the palm of his hand so so God and what they do is they reduce God to something uh, that is in actual fact just a demigod or something uh, which is very similar to the Mormon understanding of the divine uh, where man can become a deified being uh, but even beyond that is um, when they speak of and they declare, for instance, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, that man have been created in God's image, what they do with that is, is they turn man to become the grid of what God is like. Um, let me explain to you this way. The way God actualizes his faith is the way man should actualize his faith. Um, God was... Uh, uh, speaking the world into existence, therefore man should speak the world into existence. Uh, and that's why they can say man is a little G-O-D, a little God. But scripture makes it absolutely clear that there is just one God. I mean, we know the uh, scriptures, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Uh, Hear Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Uh, where Jesus speaks in Mark chapter 12 and he shows that God in himself emphatically is God and there is no other. Jesus speaks in John 17 verse 3 and says that they might come to know you as the only true God and your son. Um, so in actual fact what it does is if I truly believe that I am the true representation of God, it allows unfortunately in some of these circles for individuals to speak authoritatively as if they are God. What I found personally challenging was the idea of just seeing how emboldened and courageous people that peddled this sort of doctrine are, and how many resources they were prepared to put into the spreading of this gospel. And also a challenge personally to me was, what am I doing as a Christian to address some of these challenges? Was I as bold? Was I as courageous with the truth that I have? A while back I had a man say the following, the truth by its very nature is exclusive. That is, white is white universally, all around the world, to everyone, all the time. I just need to figure out what my role in this is going to be. But I must say I'm forever changed because I realize how pervasive these teachings are. In the Word of Faith scheme of doctrine, 
They believed that when God made man to be ruler over the earth and to subdue it, in effect, what he was doing was giving a tenancy agreement or making a tenancy agreement with Adam. So God is the owner of the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But Adam was the tenant. And as such, he had tenancy rights. He had the right to decide what he wanted to do with the earth. And so when man fell, they believed that man was basically in effect handing over the, the tenancy agreement to Satan and therefore Satan became the legal ruler over the earth and this put God on the outside. So as far as the tenancy agreement spans, with the exception of some things reserved to God's sovereignty, God has basically made it illegal for himself to step into the earth and to act except by man's permission. And that's why the Abrahamic covenant is so important to the word of faith doctrine, because in becoming blood brothers, God through Abraham got a foothold into the earth again. And, and that's what they teach that when, when Jesus died for our sins, he had to be taken to hell and suffer for our sins there. But Satan was basically outsmarted by Jesus because he was taken there illegally and therefore forfeited his right to the earth. And Jesus took that authority back from Satan and has now given it to the church. And therefore, God cannot act on this earth without man praying, without us praying. So we have the authority, Jesus doesn't have it, we have it. Now there's some problems with this kind of theology. Firstly, where does this concept of a lease agreement, where does it come from? How do we read this into scripture? You can't take this delegated authority that God gave Adam and regard that as a lease. Scripture doesn't say it was a lease. So God had every right to judge man and to judge Satan. The reason God doesn't and the reason why God allows Satan to continue to blind the, the eyes of the unbelieving and to rule the nations that follow him is because if God had to put a stop to Satan here and now, he would have to put a stop to Satan's subjects as well. And, and God doesn't want any to perish, he wants all to come to repentance.